I remember those days, yeah. All right, with that, I think uh, let's jump into the workshop. Sure. Yes, Arish. Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the second episode of Build with Astro TV series. And in this specific workshop, we'll quickly walk you through what Build a Modern Data App Hackathon is about and an introduction to how you can launch your Astro TV instance in less than six clicks, which is five clicks only, and how you can get started running your own instance of AstroDB on the cloud and access it using any programming language you know you don't have to learn a specific programming language to participate in this hackathon just a quick disclaimer and with that we'll jump into a quick fireside chat with our experts on the panel Sean and Bala where we will talk about what AstroDB is about what is Cassandra and so on and after that is the best part of today's workshop you'll quickly learn how to create a Netflix clone where you can deploy something like a Netflix on your own, right? And that after that, we'll quickly jump into Q and A. If you have any questions any time through the whole workshop, please feel free to pose them in the chat or the Q and A box. With that, what is Build a Modern Data App Hackathon? It's a three-day virtual hackathon where we want you guys to use AstroDB as your core of the application and build an app around it. And if you are in the top, uh, three apps, you get to be part of the data stacks incubator program that starts on September 9th of this year and get a chance to become a unicorn if you have the potential. So yes, no restrictions, no limitations, no themes, no categories, nothing. We are not restricting you anywhere. Just build with what you know, but use AstroDB as your database. That's it. And yes, so the first step is obviously go to the website, sign up, join the Slack channel and attend one of these pre hackathon workshops, which you are already doing. So if you're on the Zoom call and not on YouTube, of course, but yes. And after that, look at the participants guide. We have a bunch of things for you to uh, take away from this hackathon, not just the prizes. There are more. And after that is you building through September 3rd to 5th and then demoing uh, to us what you've built. And what are the prizes? There are too many prizes to take away. Make sure you go check out the website for all the prizes that you can take away. But the guaranteed t-shirt that you can take away can be earned using three steps only. One is by registering, sign up on AstroDB and join the Slack channel. That's it, that gets you an entry onto the leaderboard. And then you are guaranteed a t-shirt. And if you want to invite your friends, you will get a referral link right after you sign up. So make sure you send that referral link to your friends and ask them to join. Invite as many people as you can and stand a chance to win. So apart from the top three prizes, which earn $5,000, $3,000, $2,000 $2, respectively, we also have Hacker's Choice Award where all the participants get to vote on their favorite projects and whichever stands out also gets a prize in the hackathon. And we'll also pick the most innovative project and also the most impactful project apart from all of these projects that you already submit. So I'll not exhaust you and bore you by talking about this uh, a lot, but make sure you check the website to know what are all the other prizes that you're going to earn through just signing up for this hackathon. And make sure you submit, guys. It's, I'm not asking you to not submit, but make sure you submit. That's the key. So this is the timeline. We are at the second workshop today on August 7th. We have three more workshops to go. We are doing these workshops every Saturday through this whole month. And on August 28th, we'll do a team building session where you can find a team member if you don't have a team member. And Hackathon starts on September 3rd and ends on September 5th during when you have to code, not through the whole month. This month is dedicated for you to learn AstroDB. Nobody has ever done this before with hackathons, so make sure you utilize this. Right. And uh, we have a bunch of mentor hours through the two days. We have mentors from data stacks who will help you guide you with wherever you're stuck when you're deploying with AstroDB, which you shouldn't be because it is pretty straightforward for anybody who doesn't even know databases. So, yes. So that's the rough timeline of uh, this whole program. With that, I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists for today. We have Sean and Bala. Sean is the developer community's lead data stacks and Bala heads the tech at Center of Excellence at NIIT USA. And over to you gentlemen from here, and I'll catch you again for the fireside chat with some interesting questions about Apache Cassandra and AstroDB. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Harish. Thank you for everyone who is here live and a hello to everyone who will be watching this later. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for wherever you are in the world. We are very happy that you joined us here today. As Harish had told you, I'm here with my friend, mentor, and colleague, Bala Subramaniam um, Sundershow. But for short, I get to call him Bala, just so that I don't stumble through my words as much in this presentation. Bala, would you like to say something to the folks who are watching us live and later? Sure, thank you, Sean, Harish, and Asta. Always great to be here and always great to talk about Cassandra and data stacks, especially with you, Sean. Our <laughs> conversations on this go back a long way, right? And um, we've seen this database evolve, flourish, and grow so much over the last four or five years that we are in awe of it. And I'm glad that we're having this uh, one month of, you know, these chats and conversations that lead up to the hackathon which I think is a glorious idea because I think that is the purpose of Astra to make the developer's life easy. And we want all of them to feel that easiness. That's what we're in for. So let's start the chat. Yep. All right, so just before we actually dive into Astra DB, there's a great question from Aditya. Um, I'm still confused what exactly the term Cassandra is. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with what Cassandra is, we are talking about the NoSQL database, Apache Cassandra. Um, if you wanna talk about the Greek mythology, I can do that too, but let's move that to the Slack channels um, because the Greek mythology about Cassandra is um, extremely interesting, but it's a long conversation. So let's not waste our time here today. But Apache Cassandra, as I mentioned, is a NoSQL database and um, Datastack specifically has built their entire um, you know, their entire branding and their entire technology stack on this technology. Now that said, there are different flavors available to you. And the main flavor that we're going to be talking about here, right, is going to be AstraDB. Now AstraDB in just in one sentence is Apache Cassandra as a service. That's basically what AstraDB is. Now there's more to it than that, which we're going to get into as we move along. But just to get everybody up to speed, um, what it is and how it works, can just think about it like this. AstraDB is how you can deploy Apache Cassandra to any cloud, uh, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, doesn't matter, anywhere in the world within five clicks. That's the key, crucial part. Um, Harish, could I share my screen for a minute just to show everybody real quick because that'll get everybody in the right mindset? Yeah. All right. So for anybody who is here live or watching this at a later time, I'm noticing that I'm flailing my arms again. Um, first of all, go to the website, right? Buildamoderndataapp.com and that'll bring you to what we're seeing here today. The second thing is scroll down. We see a lot of information here and we see two links. One, register for the hackathon. First of all, please register for the hackathon so that you can be considered for winning prizes and glory and fame and awesome stuff and just so much more, I can't even name it. But the second link is sign up for an AstraDB account. So if I click on the sign up, it's automatically gonna bring me to the Astra uh, login page. Now you can either register with an email if you want, you can use your GitHub account or like I'm gonna do because I'm lazy and I don't wanna type, I'm gonna use my Google account. By clicking on the Google SSO, it's gonna bring me to my dashboard. And from here, as you can see, this is what everybody sees. Now I haven't started anything just yet. So I did my first click, right? Log in. Second click, create a database. Now in here, you can give it whatever you want, right? I'm gonna call this Netflix clone angel hacks just because, and because I'm lazy, I'm also gonna call my key space, which is basically your top level namespace container, the same thing. And just because once again, I am lazy, I'm going to just click on the first available one. Let's see, South Carolina is the closest to where I live currently. So I'm just gonna click on that. And as you can see here, we get a little overview on the right side about, about what your costs are. Now, for those of you wondering like, do I have to pay for this? I have some good news for you. Let's just create the database, right? And while that's running, I'll explain this. Every single person who creates a, an Astra database will get $25 per month for free. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, right? But here is what that means in terms of reads, right? That's roughly about 4 million reads, roughly about a million to 2 million writes and give or take 40 gigabytes of disk space for you to store your data per month for free. 
Now, for those of you who are thinking like, ooh, but how do I make a Netflix clone without going over my data? This is where you have your um, video server, your video streamer, make that a local streamer that is already in your network at home and just allow AstroDB to assign a token for your streaming session. And then you don't have to worry about the data, right? So there's a lot of ways to work around the data limitations if you wanna be for free. That said, what we're looking for is serious developers who are looking to create something special, right? We're not looking for people who can just create something for one time. We're looking to give everybody who's participating the chance to become the next unicorn. What does that mean? We have an incubator program that is kicking off right after this hackathon, which is looking for developers, entrepreneurs, people who have ideas but don't know how to build it. Bring them through a mentoring process to help you become a startup, to get your idea so sophisticated that you can put it in front of investors and try to obtain funding. That's what we're here to do. So that's everything in a, nef or in a nutshell. As you can see, I've talked for about two and a half minutes and my database is already up and running. So remember, that's been two clicks um, to create it and the third click to launch it. So that's three clicks so far and I'm already, I already have it live. From here, we have our CQL console that is built into your dashboard. So you don't have to install CQL as H. It's just right there for you. And I can see the key spaces that are here, including the one that's in quotes, Netflix clone angel hack. So it's already ready to go. Okay. Now the two remaining clicks, cause I said five clicks, one is going to be connect, right? We have multiple different options. We have document API, GraphQL API, REST API. We can connect through drivers. We can use SDKs and we can use other options as well. So that'll be your fourth click to actually connect to your database. And then your fifth click is let's load some data. Boom. Now you have your database up and running. You have connected to your database and you have loaded data into your database and you can now start running queries and run your app immediately. Of course, it is a little bit more nuanced. We need to deploy some code, but the theory is five clicks gets you an up and running database. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now if I can get everything to work again and hand it back to Harish so Bal and I can continue to fireside chat. Now, this basically means that we are now up, running and live. Now what? And this is where some of these tools come into play. So Bala, most of these tools you are familiar with already. Would you like to share some of your insights with the folks who are joining us here today? Oh, yes. I think um, that's a good demo, by the way. Fantastic. That's how, e that's how easy it is to get to AstroDB, <clears throat> you know, and for especially for folks who, who have struggled with the earlier install and clustering of Cassandra nodes, this must be a blessing, right, to be able to do it. Yeah, I think, you know, the the way the industry is moving is that, you know, we want to give developers a uniform handle to talk to any products. I think that's the, you know, general industry standard, no matter whether it is a database or any other platform, right, have the developers. And I think Stargate is Datastax's, um, you know, <clears throat> idea of providing that uniform get gateway, right, whether you want to talk to the database using REST or GraphQL or Document APIs. We don't want them to struggle with different, you know, uh, platforms. Stay, say, use Target. In fact, for the hackathon, I I strongly urge everybody to use Target, right? Though the temptation may be there to say, hey, let me not use it. I can kind of, you know, just use a language. But I sincerely urge because that's going to be the standard for us going forward, and that's the industry standard. And the rest of it, the second and third, the, S, the CQL search and data stacks bulk loader have always been there with us, right? They're nothing new, but uh, they've been ported for AstroDB. The SQL search is what Sean just showed you, right? When he showed you the table key spaces, he had used a shell, right? So, and that's of course, for anybody who wants to, you know, see that black little command prompt and type out stuff, you're always, I'm, I mean, Sean and me are like that. We like to use it. Uh, but again, it's a preference. Bulk, data stacks bulk loader. Um, you know, traditionally, there were various ways of loading data into Cassandra. But I think with AstroDB, I think uh, the data stacks bulk is the preferred way, right? And again, 
nothing strange or mysterious about it, right? You load your rows, you load your database. You need something to upload your data, right? In fact, the last screen on Sean Sean's demo brought you to that page. So what you do is essentially bulk load your data. It could be millions of rows, which is usually the case. Cassandra is not for your 100 row kind of applications. It's for your million or more than a millions of rows of database. So you need a feature that will help you load. And the last one is my personal favorite with regards to Astra. I think we were, we were sorely needing that kind of a dashboard, right? To get that up and going on a traditional on-prem Cassandra cluster wasn't a nightmare, but it was difficult. Right, yes. but with Astra DB, we've got a lot of these third party frameworks. I think Prometheus, Grafana, Medusa, lots of you know, we've, we've not reinvented the wheel, right? We've used open source frameworks, right? And we built it so beautifully into Astra that it looks as though they seamlessly integrate, right? And they were built for this purpose. So, my only request on this slide, and then I'll hand it over to Sean is use all of these, right? Use all of this in the project, right? And that's when you will get to feel the beauty of it. Back to you, Sean. I think that was a very eloquent way of stating it. Um, as you said, there are alternate ways of uploading data, but they come with um, a whole bunch of extra information that you need. For example, Spark is a great way to upload data to any Cassandra deployment. However, you will require Spark knowledge to maximize the usage. If you don't know what Apache Spark is um, and you're going to try to use it for bulk loading your data for the first time, it's going to be a challenge. So I do not recommend um, diving into those kind of things. That said, Harish, could you go to the next slide? We do have multiple avenues for everybody to learn. Okay, so for the for most of the people who are going to be joining this hackathon, Apache Cassandra, DataStax, and AstraDB are all brand new concepts. Or you know you might have heard it, you know, in passing sometime at some point, but you're not quite confident what you can do. Our friends, um, the developer advocate group at DataStax, they have their own YouTube channel, and they have so much content there to help make everything easy for you. Okay, so. My recommendation for everybody who's joining us is to definitely go check that out if you want to have an in-depth um, experience, right, in a workshop format. So there's two kinds of experience you can do. There's like a learning series that you can see here on the left of your screen, right? Those are multiple videos and each is roughly about one and a half to two hours, give or take. And that will give you an extremely well-rounded um, knowledge base for Cassandra. But if you just want to do like a quick, well, relatively quick, I should say, get started, right? We also have the intro to Cassandra for developers. It will just basically run down what is Cassandra and how to use it in about two hours. Now, besides those, there's a multitude of different videos that you can check out, all made on the same uh, channel. I recommend uh, checking it out if you want to. But what about the people who just want to get hands on and don't want to watch videos? We also have an option for you guys, or for, I should take the masculine out, for everybody male or female or otherwise. If you go to uh, the datastacks.com slash dev, D-E-V, right? It'll bring you to a page that has a lot of little scenarios, right? How do I do CQLSH? How do I connect? How do I do all of these little scenarios where you can get your hands on immediately, right? We use something called Catacoda to provide these environments. There you go. Um, we provide these different kinds of opportunities for people to really get some true hands-on experience and you know really get to coding fast because one of the one of the things that i hate the most when i'm working on this is having to sit through eight hours of somebody talking at me before i even touch my keyboard that's not gonna that's not gonna work for for me personally i want to get started as soon as possible and um i highly recommend for those of you who want to do hands-on go to the slash dev page um for those of you who like to watch video go to our developer advocates youtube channels those are going to be the right kind of um places to go Previously, for those of you who are who've been around longer, we also had something called the Data Stacks Academy at one point. That's where Bala and I did the bulk of our work in the early days, where we got to work in the trenches together. Um, but that is when Cassandra was not as easy to use. So it's really a choice what you want to. 
I recommend going with the newer, uh, more modern versions just because it will make your life easier. Now that said, obviously there's a whole bunch that comes with it, right? What else can I build on AstroDB? So Bob, have you got um, ran into some examples in the field of people looking to build a cloud native uh, application that you were like, oh, that would be a good one for Astra? Oh, in fact, every day, Sean, in fact, uh, as you know, you know, we support a lot of customers on, you know, a variety of technologies and applications. And almost over the last few years, or every application stack we have built is invariably on the cloud. Right yes. and um, and the and the movement is have as much of it on the cloud, right? The on prem is slowly becoming superfluous in an application stack. Not that people are moving away from it completely, but then there is a general propensity to move to the cloud, right? And then you know that's that's in fact when we teach classes, when we evangelize Cassandra, Sean, as you and I have done. I think that's been a recurring question that we've always been asked. It, yes. I mean, can we can we have a cloud-based <laughs> provisioning of Cassandra, right? And um, you know, and we were finding that question a little, you know, we couldn't answer it at some point. But with AstroDB, we can confidently now go back and say, look, not only do you can you provision, but you can monitor, you can you can perform a lot of stuff, right, without you know breaking into a sweat. And that's true of every other customer that you know I've 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 supported through NIT through our Stack Route teams. In fact, just to convey what we're doing, in fact, over the last few months, I've been actively advocating AstraDB, right? So wherever you know there is a choice of polyglot kind of database, and we need to use a NoSQL database, the choice now is leaning towards AstraDB primarily because of the power of Cassandra, the scalability and the extensibility. And second, now that we've made it so easy to use, there's no reason why anybody shouldn't, right? So there is this definite movement in the industry, absolutely. Awesome. With that, I'll give a little shout out to our developers who helped make this happen um, at Datastax. There are so many of them. Uh, Jim McCollum and his team, Jim leads the Astra team. So thank you for all your hard work over the past couple of years to get this up and running. You have made my life a lot easier because it is so much easier to talk about Astra DB than it was about doing the uh, installation back in the day that you and I used to teach a lot of days to get people to have a proper stack. You're right, Bala? Go ahead. Absolutely, Sean. I just want to augment what you said. Yeah, we can't thank the people who did this enough. I mean, yeah. words are not enough to describe what these applications mean to the evangelization of Astra DB. In fact, as all of you know in this audience, NIT is a worldwide education organization, and I had the technology part of it, right? And uh, you know, if anybody wants to learn Cassandra, all that I point, I mean, tell them is point them to one of this the this page and say, go do it. It's not only so beautifully developed; the applications are so you know self-contained. They're so well documented. Right, and I and I, this is my favorite phrase. Even a child can navigate through those GitHub repositories and not yes. make a mistake. Believe me, right? I, I I'm I'm yet to come across a, a repository that has thought so deeply about the user and what potential pitfalls they can fall into and documented it. Right. So for those of you who are building this, you know, for the hackathon, I would sincerely urge you right to work through at least one two three of these apps from start to finish you'll find your life easy back to you sean uh, exactly so harish was actually um sending some information out there for everybody he was showing us the sample apps gallery what apps are in there but i think that's actually a great little bridge considering the time and what harish was showing us for me to show everybody how do i actually get our netflix clone up and running all right so if i could get the screen back for a couple of minutes, I can show people in a short demo. And the reason why I say short demo is because I'm not going to go through each and every step um, with you. And the reason why is because we want to respect your time. We know that all of your time is valuable, right? And therefore we want to make sure everybody gets max value. All right, so as we see, 
our dashboard, right? Simple. We see that there's some storage has been consumed, right? No reads, no writes yet because I haven't done anything. I haven't actually created any kind of tables yet. So that's why we don't see anything. I'm still on my $25. So that means I haven't used any of it uh, either. And there's another option here. If you want to go serverless, you can actually click create serverless database, but we're not going to dive into the serverless right now. What we're going to look at is the sample apps gallery located here in the left hand side of my screen. Now, clicking on the sample apps gallery, we can see that there is a multitude of options available for you. Now, <clears throat> that said, is this all there is? No, absolutely not. There's so many uh, different ideas that we've had over the past couple of years um, for Apache Cassandra. And over the past year, starting last year in August, we have received over 150 different kind of app ideas through the different events that we've run. So that means you are not limited to anything that you see on the screen. Take all of this as a guideline so that you can use it to spring into your next possible idea. So the first thing we want to click on is the Netflix clone, right? We want to look at this. So if we can see here to try now, we can see the view on GitHub and that's going to open the GitHub repository exactly. For those of you who are very hyper observant, uh, you can see that I'm not even signed in and I still get access to this, right? So I don't get the infamous uh, Jedi 404. This is not the page you're looking for message from GitHub. We have made it open for everyone. Now, that said, I do want to give one more shout out to a friend of ours uh, at Datastax. She does not work for us, but she is absolutely fantastic. It's uh, Anya Kubau. She actually did um, this original Netflix clone video on her channel on YouTube. Please look her up. She's amazing. Uh, she had an actual Netflix engineer talk about the code, the clone and everything, and talk about the, the, the lessons that they had learned at Netflix while they've been helping to develop Cassandra 4, because they've been a big player there too. So it's an extremely valuable and informative uh, video that you can see there, which is why I just wanted to give her a shout out because she's one of our main contributors as well. Now that said, let's dive into the actual steps. So as you can see here, we have set this up that it should take you about 10 minutes. It's a beginner level, right? And it's just going to help you start building. The reason why we wanted to make it this simple is because it's not about us, right? It, data stacks is irrelevant in this process. We want to make it all about you, the developers, the entrepreneurs, the operators, the crazy innovative people who just want to do cool stuff. All of you, that's who this is for, right? Not data stacks, you, all of you. So, first of all, how do we build an Netflix clone? In this case, we're going to use the GraphQL connection, right? That's our GraphQL API, but you don't have to use your GraphQL API. It's just the choice that we made to make it easy for everyone. Now, the video that will actually give you the walkthrough can be found right here. This link is freely accessible to everyone. I'll just show you real quick. Um, it opens up the real short informational video. It, oh, this isn't, shouldn't be the one. Um, so as you can see here, now this, this is the one we look, let's code Netflix clone GraphQL pagination reviewed by Netflix engineer. That's the one that we're looking for created by Anya Kubau and it is phenomenal. Let me go back to our screen and get help. So that's the actual video. That is about two hours. Now, if you don't want to do it in two hours and you feel confident in your coding skills, let's just skip how this works and go straight to the get started, right? We have some prerequisites here that we definitely want to call out. We want to make sure, of course, it doesn't uh, load the way I want it to. The prerequisites are going to help you set up everything the way you need it before you move on. Now, the prerequisites here, you want to use Netlify, right? We use Netlify um, a lot in our sample apps because it makes life easy, right? So shout out to our friends at Netlify. They recently um, announced that Datastacks AstroDB is part of their back and stack as well. So love that. Thank you for that mention. After we do the install of Netlify, right? I could do the demo on screen, but I feel that if I do the demo on screen, we're all just going to be sitting and waiting for code to deploy rather than just go through the steps and allow for a, a more personalized experience by having some Q&A. Because I see there's a lot of chatting going on and I haven't acknowledged any of the conversations just uh, yet. Um, Jesse, yes, you can deploy it on Google. You just have to make sure that if you use the Google 
um, cloud for your Azure deployment, then that's what you use. If you start up an AWS or an Azure, then of course you can't deploy it on Google, but there is no limitation to which cloud provider you can use. Literally, Astra, AWS, or sorry, Google, AWS, and Azure, all three of them are available for you to choose from. Now that said, the same goes for regions. You are not limited to any one region. Now, you are limited to the reasons we make available for you, but uh, for those of you who are looking through all the available options, we have covered every um, continent in uh, the major three. So we have an APAC, an EMEA, and an America's um, location to try and make it easier. We will be able to provide you with more regions as Astra starts to develop and expand. But for now, let's keep it simple and let's not make it too difficult on us. If you want to expand into different regions, let's talk about it offline. Now, once you created your Astra DB instance, right? We already learned five clicks and we have our Astra DB up and running. This will bring us to the page that we saw earlier, right? Our dashboard will show us that we have something up and running. So these steps are already done. Now, as you can see, lots of information. We're gonna skip all of that because we're not gonna waste your time. And once we have our database up and running, that is when we actually get started. Now, for those of you who are already a little bit uh, versed in NoSQL, a lot of us ask about security. One of the main things that we want you guys, to, or not you guys, I apologize for using the masculine, for everybody who is joining us for this hackathon to see is that it is important that we set up security token for connection to our database, okay? So we can use this, create the security token right here, right? It brings us to our documentation for Astro DB. It should be pretty simple, but all of the steps have been um, laid out for you in, in a way that it should be logical. If you run into any problems, that's what we have our mentors and our coaches for. So please reach out to us. And we even have a little bit of a demo of what it should look like upon successful connection. After we have our security token set up and we have Netlify installed and we're ready to go, right? The now we can actually start getting into the nitty gritty. So let's create a table genre with GraphQL. So we use our GraphQL, right? Our backend, so that's our connection. We click on the Active Database Connect tab, click on the GraphQL API, and that'll bring us into this section. So since I haven't set anything up yet, if I click on my... Um, my database, my connect, GraphQL API, it's gonna look slightly different because I haven't set up my security token just yet. So that's the reason why. But most of the stuff that we just talked about is already here, launching your G, uh, GraphQL playground, right? We want to make sure that you add your token. This is the piece that I'm not doing right now. So we wanna add your security token um, to the HTTP headers, right? That's the important piece to be able to play around. Then we replace the current GraphQL playground URL with the region URL that you have. We have the create table option right here that you can literally copy paste. We have our key space option right here. We can describe our tables right here. As you can all see, it automatically takes my key space name and fills it in for us already. So once again, what we're trying to do here is create a frictionless experience for everybody to make it easy for all of you. We are not using demo whatever. No, this is your actual name. So to really make it as simple as possible for everyone. Now, then we're going to get to the point where we can start writing some data, right? We can add two books to the book table, which is going to be great. In this case, Moby Dick and Catch-22. Um, for those of you who have read these books, welcome to the uh, being old category, because I talked to my godson who's 21 years old about Moby Dick, and he's like, oh, you mean the movie? I'm like, oh my goodness. I am officially old because, yeah, I didn't mean the movie, but I meant the book before the movie, but that's okay. That's just, that's a whole different kind of situation. Now, going through everything, we, sh we should see a return. We should also try to run some of our reads, right? We should see a return on that too. We are going to do some updates and we're going to do some deletes. What we basically did with all of these steps, create a key space, create a table, load data, read data, write data, um, change data, delete data. Boom. Now we've run a successful run through of your GraphQL API. So that is setting that up. So that was step number four. And we're already halfway through, right? That's how quickly it goes. Now from here, 
There's some more steps here in the playground. It's actually going to give you some different information. So the sample apps gallery and the GraphQL sample that we just saw is based upon our deployment. This GitHub repo is based upon the Netflix clone deployment. So it gives you slightly different names, as you can see here. Um, Eric, he's, uh, he's in the chat here as well, and he's on camera. Eric, good to see you. He has been a part of so many of these workshops. I blindly recommend asking him any kind of pitfall questions that you might have because he's been through this so many times. He is the guru and the go-to that I recommend to everyone. So wave hi to Eric. He is uh, based in Australia. So he is very friendly to the APAC region as well. Um, I'm based in the East coast of the United States. So I'm actually the worst uh, APAC friendly person in the entire database um, or database world. So, now that we know who Eric is and we know how to contact Eric in case we need some help, now let's look at inserting data. Because as I told everybody, the, the whole key for this is frictionless experience, right? The frictionless experience, because we don't want to make it hard. Now, I do have to uh, mention, um, I said this last week, for those of you who were here last week, we had a hackathon that recently ended um, and we had a person. And I, I gotta give this person all the kudos in the world because I love the audacity of this person. They used this Netflix clone as their submission to try and win the hackathon. Unfortunately, we couldn't let them win because this is our application. So there was no innovation on their end, but you got to applaud the audacity of just being like, you know what, I'm gonna go for it. Why not? So we, uh, we, we recognize that person, their efforts. It was really funny, but we just couldn't do anything with that. So don't use this as your submission. Now that we have some GraphQL understanding, now let's start inserting some data because that's going to be important. Now, as you can see here, we have some steps, what we need to do in the GraphQL playground. We want to use the GraphQL tab. We also want to make sure that the key space that we create or name that we make is Netflix. We want to use the HTTP header variable, the X Cassandra token, right? To make sure, uh, make sure everything works. Yes, Eric, that's actually a good segue. Thank you for that. Bala did mention Stargate earlier. Stargate is an open source project that we started at Datastax that has all of these API opportunities for you to connect. So document, GraphQL, REST, and SQLSH are all part of Stargate. For those of you who are interested in what Stargate is and want to know more, stargate.io is our website for this. And unfortunately, it has nothing to do with the TV show or the movie. Um, but if any of you wants to talk about the TV show or the movie um, outside of this uh, venue, please ping me on Slack. I am a huge fan. I am such a fan that I have a tattoo of Apophis arguably the greatest bad guy ever because he got killed like six times and came back. All right, but I digress. I was trying to stick with the movie conversation because we're talking about Netflix, but let's get back to the actual developer piece of this. So once we've loaded some data, right, it's going to be really, really important that we follow the next steps um, really carefully. Because in the GraphQL playground, we want to populate the reference list, reference list with all of these values so that we can actually um, link to them properly later on. Now, once we've done that, once we've uh, populated that, the next step is going to retrieving the list of values. So we're actually going to retrieve the list. The value is going to label genre, right? So we want to get all the genres that are available. Now, once we do that, we can see here, it might be a little, actually, let me zoom in a little bit. There we go. We can see here that we can see value action, value anime, value award-winning, this is how we can confirm that everything worked correctly. Now, I do love the fact that we changed this to anime um, because the very first iteration of this uh, Netflix clone, somebody had put manga and I said, manga are the, uh, the actual, you know, the, the, the comic books, anime is the animation. So I'm glad to see that that actually got changed. And Eric made a great comment in the chat. For Stargate IO, you do not need to learn CQL, which stands for Cassandra Query Language, right? Basically, in order for you to use Cassandra, or in this case, AstroDB as your backend, all you have to know is the API. Okay, great one, Eric. Thank you again. And this is why I'm, I'm always promoting Eric as the go-to guru, because these little tidbits of information are crucial to make your experience more pleasant. All right, next step, step number seven, creating the movies table. It's very simple. For those of you who are looking at this code and be like, really, that's all? Really, that's all. And for those of you who are looking at this code and be like, oh, that, 
you know, I'm not comfortable with the code that I'm seeing on screen. That's why we want you to go through these steps. It's meant to be as easy as possible. Most of this can be copy pasted into your deployment. That's how easy it is. Little nuances like, you know, little making sure that you have, you know, the quotes there properly, making sure that you close things off with the curly brackets and stuff. These are all just things that you need to learn as a developer to make sure you have this. So for our youngers who are joining us today, be critical when you read through this, read everything carefully and you should be okay. Now, when we look at the expected output, as we can see here, we've created, uh, we created the movies table, right? We have all these different things. We want to see movies by genre is true. So that's what we're going to be expecting. The next step is going to be step eight. And now we're really getting to the last few items because now we're going to start inserting values into this movie table, right? And these values are going to start giving us results when we start executing our queries. Now, in this case, we're inserting a movie by genre. It's going to be a sci-fi 2010 inception, um, a little synopsis, duration, thumbnail, all of that. So this is all going to be put into the movies table and we're going to do the same for Prometheus and the same for aliens, same for Blade Runner. Oh, I wish they would have done Blade Runner, the new one, 2046, I believe it is as well, just for completeness, but kudos for using aliens, which is the movie number two, which is by far the best in the entire alien genre. That's my opinion. You don't have to share it, but I, I really believe that aliens is the best one. Now, once we've updated the tables and our expected output, we can now see that we're starting to see things come through. We are getting to the point where we can now start to retrieve the actual values from the movies table because we have literally populated everything already. Now, once we query the get movie action, movies by genre, genre is going to be sci-fi, the year is going to be in descending order. That's what we're going to execute. And as we can see here, we can see in descending order, meaning we're going to go by newest first and go to the oldest that way, right? So we're already starting to see results. This means that we can now kick off our actual Netflix clone, right? We want to create the, uh, the .env file, right? We want to go through the NPM install, Netlify, dev, and this is where we can now deploy, all right? Now, for those of you who are sitting at home thinking to yourself, oh, can I do this and can I keep it running for myself? Absolutely. Absolutely. Feel free to build this, keep it as a home usage device. But remember, for those of you who were here at the beginning, Datastax does not endorse downloading or pirating anything illegally. This is meant to be created to um, showcase your own personal library that you have already. Okay. So we're not going to provide you with movies. We are not going to provide you with the actual content. That is up to you to, uh, to provide yourself. And then, you know, if you want to be super nerdy like myself, instead of Netflix and chill, Netflix and code is, you know, is a recipe for a good weekend on my end. I love to geek out. So that was it for my demo. And I'm going to hand it back to Asta and Harish, unless anybody has anything pressing, because I saw that the chats have been going on. Bala and Eric have been answering people, which is awesome. It means that my part here is even easier. All right, Asta, back to you and Harish. Awesome. That was, I think, uh a great walkthrough of how people can deploy a Netflix demo or a clone. Uh, for the panelists today, I have, I've had many questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to ask one question, right? Very important question is Sean and Bala and Eric also, please tell us who are using Astro TV? What are the success stories of Astro TV? And who are these companies that are using Astro TV just to get some in inspiration? Um, that's actually a loaded question. I think all three of us are very familiar with multiple companies that use it. Um, but all three of us are also very aware that multiple companies have NDAs that we're not supposed to be sharing it. Um, so I'm going to play the privilege, think, privilege yeah. card. And say, okay, there, Eric. Probably just to modify this question a bit, uh, not the names, but just the success story. I mean, we would just love, and I think all of our audience would also love to hear how how successful they can become or how successfully they can launch an app using AstroDB. So not the, no names, but yeah, stories probably. Yes. So in that case, and Bala, Eric, please uh, jump in if you wish. The most popular one 
or the most, the most well-recognizable that we can name by name, shout out to our friends at Venmo is Venmo, right? It's a PayPal subsidiary, or I believe they've actually, they're the parent. I can't remember, but Venmo has a wonderful success story that showcases what Asher is and why they chose it. And that is one that I can actually share. I put the link in the chat for everybody. And basically what they what they were looking at um, in terms of using Cassandra previously before AsherDB was already there. They were already investigating it and really deep into the tech. As AsherDB was developed and deployed to the public at large, Venmo was one of the early adopters because in their own words, I apologize, I have the hiccups for no reason. Um, in their own words, is that the promise of AsherDB is a true database as a service with no ops, right? I can't stress that enough. Back in the day, I know this is like old people 101, back in the day, and Bala, please jump in here. Teaching ops configuration, um, that took up multiple days of training. Mm -hmm. It was rough, right? It was one of those challenges that, out of everything that made Apache Cassandra look harder than it was because you had to be so nuanced, right? We're using uh, YAML files that are so sensitive. They're more sensitive than, you know, than somebody getting bullied, right? One space versus two spaces means something completely different. It was extremely difficult. So the having no ops and having a true database as a service, that is what drew Venmo to be an early adopter. And because of that, their words were, this helped their developers work more efficiently so that they can spend more time on innovation, less time on operations, configuration, and tuning, right? Because that is a killer, getting your time to market. So that's what I would recommend having a look at their uh, use case that they shared with us. But there are many more. Um, Asher DB adoption is on the rise. And the reason why I say it's on the rise is a lot of companies are already using Cassandra. They're looking into Astra as their new replacement for on-prem, or even some of them are looking to do a hybrid deployment, partially on-prem, partially in the cloud, right? And a lot of other companies, especially banks, are looking at microservices as another option, right? Um, I talked about this last week that there are a lot of banks in the world who are looking to replace their mainframe. These are expensive. They take a long time. And for a lot of things, it's actually no longer needed. So that's another thing that people are looking into. Eric, with your experience, do you have any other um, names that come to mind? Um, not so much names, but use cases, right? So one of the things that I found really interesting is there's a lot of companies that use um, AstraDB for um, authentication to provide, you know, um, ex uh, authentication for their systems. Um, and, and at first I was really surprised by that. So think of companies that, for example, you know, gaming platforms where you have people, uh, users and gamers from all over the world, you know, authenticating. So you need a, a system, a database that can scale, that can be deployed um, across the globe. Um, so one of the strengths of Astra is the fact that you can deploy in multiple clouds. So you're not just tied to a specific vendor. So it's not just on AWS, you can also deploy on GCP and you can deploy on Azure. Right, which means that you can bring your data really close to where your um, customers are, to where your users are, and you know that's one of the big things that um, I guess why uh, lots of companies that have an authentication use case um, they decide to choose to deploy an Astra. Zoom etiquette one hundred and one: make sure you're unmuted before you talk. <laughs> but that's actually a great use case. So thank you for that. Harish, do you have any other questions? We, we have a couple more minutes. Yes, I do. So the next one is, what are the key features of Apache Cassandra that differentiate it from other open source databases like, let's say, MongoDB, Cosmos DB that people can use to deploy? <laughs> Harish, once again, that's a, that's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, we normally, one of the things in data stacks we always consciously tended to do was never to bash any other database, right? So we kind of, uh, but yes, I mean, there are a few things that Cassandra is very, very effective and it is proven by facts is that it is extremely responsive, right? Scalable in terms of reads and writes, right? Which is one of the important considerations of modern applications, right? So, 
I think you can always take up every every little thing and you know have a pros and cons to it. But I think these two stand up right in terms of uh, the response times of read and write, availability, right, and uh, scalability. Yeah. So any any use case that requires these two features as distinctive features. I think should look at Astra as their first choice, right? There are other NoSQL alternatives, no doubt, but all of them are for a very specific purpose where, but if the response times, right, customer user experience is critical, then I think, you know, we should look at AstraDB as a primary choice, right? So, yeah, so that will be my answer to that. Unless Sean and Eric, you want to get into some more specifics. No, I think that's actually a great way to explain that. Um, as you said, we don't bash other technologies because why would we, right? There's no point. We are just very confident that for the use cases that we talk about all the time, we are the most scalable database in the world. This is backed up by the fact that yeah. If you look at the Fortune 100, Fortune 500, we are everywhere. And by we, I mean the Cassandra community, right? We are literally everywhere. People are using it, literally everything. I, I used this example last time. If you have an iPhone, for example, any app store or iTunes transactions, anything you're doing, all, all Cassandra, right? So my point is, it is used everywhere. Now, each of these different technologies have their own use cases where they blow everyone else out of the water. So that is the whole point why we don't bash or say, oh, we're better that. We believe that Apache Cassandra is the most scalable database in the world with the most applicable use cases in the world and with the most potential in the world. That is our belief. And because exactly. of that belief, that is why we stick with uh, Apache oh, Cassandra as our core foundation. Just to augment what Sean said, um, also it's important for this developer audience to, to kind of realize that in modern applications, databases come in, in different flavors, right? You don't use one single database, right? We call it polyglot, right? So you could have a single use case which can use an RDBMS, could use Cassandra, could use something else could use an in-memory database. So today's applications are polyglot in nature. So given that kind of environment, right, you got to choose wisely, right? And uh, Cassandra kind of, as Sean rightly points out, we don't have to really, um, you know, bash any other database, but the metrics speak for themselves, right? And lots of companies have reported great efficiencies with their response times and availability. And that is, you know, advertisement enough for what use cases Cassandra is good for, right? There's a hard reality too. I want, just want to quick, quickly add to that. The hard reality is the fact that if you have a scale problem, you will choose Cassandra. Right. Hands down, there's no other choice out there. Right. Um, it's unfortunate, but if, if, you can, if you can continue using, you know, um, MySQL or um, all the other DBs out there, you will continue to use it. But until you encounter a scale problem where, where you're doing stuff at internet scale, just like all the other companies, you know, Netflix is never going to tell you that, you know, they're going to, you're not going to be able to watch um, any shows because they're doing an upgrade, right? Um, those are the sort of things that Cassandra solves. Correct. I agree with Eric. Yep. I think that's actually a great mic drop moment to hand it back to Harish and Asta. I think we kind of, you know, covered that question plus a, a bunch of others really well. Um, so let's not dirty up the information by going too deep into more stuff. So go ahead. Sure. I think, uh, yeah, that comes from a perspective of uh, as a developer, if I'm talking here, I think what somebody does is I'm not sure if others do it. I'm just speaking for myself is what are the alternatives for Astro DB is the first question. <laughs> before I try a new tool out, right? So we have one question from Greg. Uh, he's asking, are there any specific areas on which the app should be built for the hackathon or we can choose to build an app on any topic? Uh, there is no specific theme, Greg. You're free to build anything you want. Just make sure you use AstroDB as the core. Yeah. And then we have Astro Dashboard has got streaming option, which is in beta version. What's the use of that? If any of you want to take it. 
Yeah, Eric was actually answering it a lot more elegantly than I was. I was saying, yeah, it's it's screaming and it's Apache Pulsar. But Eric, please go ahead. You had a more eloquent response to that. Yeah, so um, essentially as just streaming, if, if you're familiar with, you know, pub sub type um, use cases where you have a, a publisher and you've got um, subscribers to a particular topic. So, um, you know, messaging systems, event-driven systems, um, Astro Streaming is built on Apache Pulsar and um, it's backed by um, an Astro database. So that's what Astro Streaming is for. Awesome. I think with that, uh, we'll move on to the last session, the last part of the session, which is uh, if you have signed up for the hackathon, what is next, right? Just make sure you join the Slack channel. The link is in the participants guide that is sent to you right after you sign up. And then make sure you sign up on AstroDB. The link is here. The link is on the website. The link is in your email. It's everywhere, guys. You, you just have to click it and sign up. Just try what Sean showed us today. And make sure you uh, launch a DB on uh, Apache, uh, uh, sorry, AstroDB. And uh, see how it works, basically. For somebody new, I think what I would do is just use what programming language I know and play around with it and see how it works first. Then get into uh, building an app for the hackathon. Hackathon is still three weeks away, right? And here are some important links. If you do all the three steps first, you get to be on the leaderboard and get to take home swag. And make sure you attend at least one workshop like this in the next upcoming weeks to be on the leaderboard. And if you Not don't have teams... Attend. Just adding, Harish. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't have a team, there is a free agents directory in the participants guide, which you can click and see who else is looking for a team. Reach out to them on Slack and make a team. And if you are finding it difficult, we are always on Slack to support you with that. And all the details of the steps that you can take are part of a checklist also, where you can see what are the steps that you have to do after you register in the participants guide and make sure you follow that. And uh, with that, we come to the end of this session. Thank you, Bala, Sean, and Eric for joining in. I'm not going to take more time of yours. We will see you next weekend. And sure. if you have any closing thoughts, please go ahead. Oh, no, it's been wonderful. I think today with Eric joining us, I think uh, it was it was fantastic. We got lovely insights. And of course, Sean, as usual, you know, uh, did a great job. So lovely audience. So we hope to see all of you again next week and the week after that. And uh, Crescendo is the hackathon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks, Eric, for jumping on. That was amazing. That was a lovely surprise, um, even though technically Datastax is supposed to be closed this week. So thank you for offering up your personal time. And to everybody who was here today or looking at this afterwards, please, any and all questions, put them into the Slack. We have multiple mentors and coaches available for you to help you out. We are here to help you. It's not about us. It's about you. So please bring your ideas, bring anything, any questions you have, and we will be there to help out. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. And we'll be in touch soon. Happy hacking. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.